Hello, today I'm going to be talking about the board game, The Game of Thrones. Uh, this is based on the books, um, which the TV, HBO TV series was also made. So I got this uh, for Christmas this year, finally broke it out uh, and played it, and thought I'd go ahead and do a video on it. So let's get started with how you set up. All right, first thing you do is put the game board in the play area where all players can reach it. Uh, this board is actually pretty long, so I'm going to have to <laughs> change how I uh, normally I do my three players down here. You know, one, two, three, but I'm not going to have room over here where the bottom of this board is, so I'll have to put all my players over here on this side. But anyway, first thing you do is... Uh, set the board in the middle of the play area next you shuffle your wilding deck it's kind of small um, shuffle that and place that on its space on the board up here then you take your wilding threat token and put it on space two of the wilding track next you'll take your westeros deck and separate it into the decks of uh, cards one, two, and three. You'll shuffle each of those decks individually and then place them somewhere near the game board um, within reach of easy reach of players. Next you'll take your neutral force tokens um, and then depending on the number of players if you're playing with three players you'll use all of the neutral force tokens and turn them to the three player side if you're playing with four, five, or six players, you'll use the ones that show the number of players. So this is for four players, this is for four to six players, and so forth. And then you'll place them on the board um, depending on the name of the region that they show. For instance, Dornish Marshes here. We'll go here on the board uh, for the Dornish Marshes. Again, I'm going to be setting up for three players, so I'll be putting the three player side up on these tokens. All right, so I've got all those neutral forces tokens on the board. And in a three player game, any of them that have this icon here in the shield, which is most of them on these neutral force tokens, it's basically saying that those uh, regions are off limits and out of play in the three player game you know there are a couple that are still in play king's landing that has a strength of five there and the airy which have a strength of six but all the other ones that have that symbol are um, neutral areas that are not uh, used in a three player game you place the game round marker on uh, position one of the round track. Players will then decide what house they want to play. In a three player game only three are available. Uh, house Stark, House Lannister, and House Baratheon. So each player will then take the uh, player screen of their house. There's seven house cards their corresponding 15 order tokens, their matching supply token, their matching influence tokens, corresponding victory point token, their garrison token, and the plastic units of their color. If playing with less than five players, you'll need to put this King's Court overlay on the King's Court track here. Cover the first four spaces, like so. Each player then looks at their player screen to look where they place their um, influence and supply and victory points. Of course the way it's shown here is for a six player game, at least as far as the influence tracks, the Iron Throne track, the Fiefdom track, and the King's Court track. So alternatively you can look in the rule book 
And for example, it shows here for a three player game, the Baratheon influence markers will be on uh, the first step of the Iron Throne track, the second step of the Fiefdoms track or Fiefdoms track, and the third step of the uh, King's Court track. So we'll place them accordingly. So the first step of the Iron Throne track, second space on the Fiefdoms track, and third space um, of the King's Court track. The spaces 4, 5, and 6 are not used in a three-player game. And so I'll set the influence markers on the tracks um, according to how it shows for the three-player game setup. And that's what I've done here. Kind of look at it this direction. Then each player who's in the first space on uh, each track takes the corresponding dominance token. So House Baratheon will take the Iron Throne dominance token, which is here. House Stark will take the uh, Fiefdoms uh, Valerian Sword. Dominance token since they're first on that track And finally house Lannister will take the uh, The messenger Raven dominance token since they are first on the King's Court track Oh, I gave that to the wrong person. There's Lannister but we can also see on the here on the player screen that their victory point marker goes on position one of the victory track. This is for House Baratheon, and uh, their supply token goes on position two of the supply track. So here's the supply track. We'll put their token on position two, and uh, their victory point um, goes on space one. We see here for House Lannister that they are also on position 2 of the supply track and position 1 of the victory track. So we'll put their tokens as stated. House Stark is on position 1 of the supply track but position 2 of the victory track. So position one of the supply track and position two of the victory track. You also look at your player screen to see where to place your starting units. It's got a little image and also tells you, for instance, how Stark starts with one ship in the Shivering Sea. So we'll take one of their plastic ships and put it here in the Shivering Sea. It says they start with one knight and one footman in Winterfell, so you can see that picture of that there. So this is a footman, and then Winterfell, and this is a knight. And finally, one footman in White Harbor. So we get the one footman, and here is White Harbor, and we'll put them there. And that's it for their starting units. I'll go ahead and uh, set up the other starting units for the other two houses. So I've placed the starting units for House Lannister and House Baratheon as shown on their uh, player card. Each player then places their garrison token in their home area. So this shows it goes in Dragonstone for Baratheon which is over here. This garrison token goes in Lannisport for uh, House Lannister. And finally this one goes in Winterfell for House Stark. You place all the power tokens for the houses in play just in a central pile somewhere near the play area and then each player starts with five of their power tokens and those should be 
placed visible, not, not behind their player screen, but visible where all players can see them, so maybe in front of their, power, their uh, player screen. Five for Baratheon, and then finally five power tokens for House Stark. And that completes setup. So I've got setup for three players. Of course, normally they wouldn't be just all adjacent to each other like this. Um, and I've had to set their plastic pieces over here just out of a matter of a room on my table. Normally they would be in the player's player area. But the board is all set up. And now we're ready to uh, go on with how to play. All right, so how do we play the game? Well, the game is played in rounds, and each round consists of three phases. There's the Westeros phase, where these cards will come into play. Then there's the planning phase, where the order tokens will come into play. And then the actions phase, where you'll resolve your order tokens. So let's talk about the Westeros phase first, since that's the first phase. Now this phase is normally skipped, or is always skipped, uh, the first turn of the game. But normally in the Westeros phase, the first thing you'll do is advance the turn marker. Of course, again, that's skipped the first turn of the game. Then you'll reveal the top three cards of each of the Westeros decks. You'll count the number of these wilding icons um, that appear on the cards and then you'll advance the uh, wilding threat marker um, that number of spaces on the wilding track. So we got one, two wilding icons. So we advance the threat marker two spaces. If that ever gets to the last space, we'll have a wilding attack and we'll talk about how we resolve that later. But after we've, re we've uh, revealed the three top three cards, as long as we haven't reached the last space on the wilding track, we don't have to resolve a wilding attack. And then we resolve the cards in order, starting with deck one. So this one says mustering, recruit new units in strongholds and castles. So let's talk about how you do that. So when you have a mustering, each house can recruit new, uni new units um, to any areas he controls that have strongholds or castles. A stronghold provides two mustering points, whereas a castle provides one mustering point. The different units cost a different amount of mustering points. A knight costs two mustering points, so in a stronghold you can muster one new knight here. Um, a footman costs one mustering point, so in a stronghold you could muster two new footmen or one knight. A ship costs one mustering point, but when you muster a ship it has to either be placed in a connected port which is this circle shape with an anchor um, since this uh, stronghold of Winterfell contains a port you can muster a ship there for one point or it can go into an adjacent sea space and this sea space you know goes all the way down here uh, to where this red line is so that entire area this ship is considered to be in so you can muster a ship into an adjacent sea space And again, that costs one point to muster a ship. A siege engine costs two mustering points, so in a stronghold you could recru recruit a siege engine uh, unit. You also have the option, if you already have a footman in that area, you can upgrade it for one mustering point to either a knight or a siege engine. So, and again, when you're mustering in a stronghold, you can muster two points worth of units or upgrade. Uh, in an area you control that has a castle, you get one point uh, to spend. 
Now when you're mustering units, you have to keep in mind the number of armies you're allowed by your supply. So here we need to talk about supply a little bit. You'll notice uh, currently at the beginning of the game, the uh, House Stark is on um, Space 1 of the supply track and House Lannister and Baratheon are Space 2. And that shows you um, the armies that you can have. So uh, House Stark can have one army with three units and one army with two units. Now an area is only considered to have an army if there are more than one unit there. So uh, an area with only one unit like this footman, that is not considered an army, so it doesn't count towards your supply. An area with only one ship, that's not considered an army, doesn't count towards your supply. But uh, like this area here in Winterfell has two units, a knight and a footman, that's considered an army. Now again, because of his allowed supply, he can have an army with three units and an army with two units. So he could have this army with two units and somewhere else he could have an army with up to three units. So when mustering here with this stronghold, he cannot muster, he cannot spend those two mustering points to get two uh, one-point footmen because that would give him four units, a four-unit army, and he's not allowed to have a four-unit army. He can only have a three-unit army at the largest. So he could spend those two points to recruit a knight here, and then he would have one three-unit army. And then... He could spend one point here to get a footman, and he would have a two-unit uh, army there, and um, that would be all he could have, one three-unit army, one two-unit army. Again, areas you control that only have one unit in it, that doesn't count toward your supply as that's not considered an army. You will, at certain points during the game, turn over a Westeros card that says supply, adjust supply track and reconcile armies so when you do that um, each house will count the number of areas they control that has one of these uh, barrels supply icons in it so if this was the case house start here would count one two just two areas he controls that has a barrel icon so that he would then look and um, he would get to move because now he has two areas he controls with the barrel icon He would get to move his supply up and now his army would be he would be able to have a three Unit army a two unit army and another two unit army as opposed to only the three and the two unit army before So whenever a supply card comes up if you've if your areas if you ha now control more areas with barrels in them that will raise you up on the supply track allowing you to have larger armies however if you've lost if you've lost uh, control of areas that had the barrel icon on them uh, like if this was the case and he only controls one then he would have to move back on the track and then if your armies exceed what you're allowed you have to remove units until you are uh, back in compliance with the armies that you are allowed by your uh, spot on the supply track. And so after you've resolved the first uh, Westeros card, then you go on and resolve the next one, and then the next one, and you just do what they say. For instance, this one says the holder of the Messenger Raven token, which at the beginning of this game is the Lannister player. He has the Messenger Raver token, Raven token. Um, the holder of the messenger token chooses whether everyone bids on the three influence tracks, which we'll talk about how that's done in a minute, or if everyone collects one power token for every power icon present in areas they control. Power icons on these, so for each area you controlled with one of those, you'd get to power token. Or this card has no uh, effect, so the the holder of the messenger token decides that and for instance this one just says support orders cannot be played during this planning phase um, we haven't talked about the orders yet but again you'll just resolve the cord the cards 
um, in order. Once you've resolved all three cards, you then move on uh, to the planning phase, which is the next phase. We should talk about, you know, this card said everyone bids on the three influence tracks. There's a, another card called the Clash of Kings in that deck that also has you bid on the three influence tracks. So let's talk about how that's done. So first let's talk about the three influence tracks. So the Iron Throne track, influence track, that determines the turn order. So anything um, that is done in turn order in the game, um, the player in the first spot here, which in this case right now is the Baratheon player, they would go first. The player in the second spot would go second. That's Lannister. And the player in the third spot, spot would be Stark in this case. So the Iron Throne track determines turn order, plus it gives you the Iron Throne token, which the player that holds that, um, which is the first player on this track, they get to break all ties except in combat. The fiefdom track is used to break ties in combat. So uh, we haven't talked about how combat works yet, but if players are tied for amount of strength in combat, whoever is higher on the fiefdoms track um, wins the tie. So for example, if House Stark and House Baratheon were in a battle and they both uh, ended up with the same amount of strength, then House Stark would win. Whereas if House Baratheon and House uh, Lannister were in a fight and they ended up with the same total of strength, House Baratheon would win because they are higher on the fiefdoms track. Also, whoever is in space one on the fiefdoms track has the Valyrian Steel Blade which they can use once per round to add plus one to their combat strength. And when they decide to use it, they just flip it over to its faded side to show that it's used, and then at the end of the round, they can flip it back up so it's available to them again the next round. And finally, on the King's Court track, as you're higher up on the track, you'll see you have a higher number of stars uh, next to your token. The number of stars indicates the number of special orders you're allowed to place during the planning phase. And uh, we'll talk about the planning phase next, but um, this player, the Lannister player, will get to use three special orders, whereas the Stark player gets to use two special orders, and the Baratheon player only gets to place one special order. So the higher you up you are on this track, the more special orders you can place. Also, it gives you the Messenger Raven token if you're in spot one on this track and the messenger raver to raven token which is this one gives you one of two options after uh, the planning phase um, when orders are revealed again we haven't talked about orders yet but we're about to when you reveal your orders that have been placed on the board uh, the holder of the messenger raven token is allowed to swap one of his orders that he placed with another one um, that he has in his supply so if he sees where he should have done a different order uh, then he's allowed to swap one or you can look at the top card of the wilding deck and decide to either keep it on the top of the deck or move it to the bottom of the deck so uh, you have you can do either one of those if you do choose to do that you then flip your token over to the faded side and at the end of the round you can flip it back up So if this court card, Clash of Kings, or another card appears that uh, tells you to bid on the three influence tracks, players at that time will take all their power tokens and hide them behind their screen. Now they've been visible before that, so the other players may have a good idea of how many power tokens they had, but uh, when you start bidding for the... Uh, three influence track you hide your power tokens behind your screen then you'll bid on the uh, iron throne track first so then each player will take a number of tokens into their hand once all players are, are ready each player reveals how much how many tokens they're bidding the player who bid the most will be moved to the first spot on the iron throne track the player who bid the second 
would be moved to the second spot and who player who bid the least would be in the last spot. Whoever bid the most would then take the Iron Throne um, token. If there is a tie for who bid the most, the current holder of the Iron Throne token, since they still hold it, would break the tie. Then all power that was bid for the Iron Throne are uh, put back into the pool so that those are not available to the players anymore. Then with the remaining power tokens, they then bid on the next track and whoever is highest on that again will go to the first space, second highest uh, middle space and uh, the least will go to the last space. Again any ties are broken by the new holder of the Iron Throne token and same with the uh, fiefdoms track, uh, I mean that's fiefdoms track, same with the King's Court track and um, Whoever's in the number one spot of each of those tracks will get the Valerian Steel Blade or the Messenger Raven token. Once all bidding is over, then you then put your remaining power tokens, if any, back in front of your screen, uh, uh, visible to all players. All right, so after you've completed the Westeros, Westeros phase where you reveal uh, the three cards, and uh, do each one then the next thing you have is the planning phase where all players will simultaneously place one order token on each area they control that contains at least one of their units so um, in this case you know this player would have to place an order token here an order token here and an order token here so um, Again, that happens simultaneously. All players will select an order and place it in each area they control that controls that contains one of their units. So let's talk about the different orders. There's five different types of order tokens. The first one uh, here is a raid. You have two normal raid tokens. And during the action phase when you're resolving uh, order tokens, a raid token allows you to remove an adjacent uh, enemy raid token or an adjacent enemy sort support token or an adjacent enemy um, consolidate power token. Uh, this is a support token and this is a consolidate power token. So if for example um, we had a situation like this, this player was resolving his raid token and there's an adjacent support token he could remove that raid token to remove that uh, opponent's um, support token. So again a raid order a raid token allows you to remove an enemy's raid token or uh, his support order token or his consolidate power token. If you, if you resolve a raid order to remove an opponent's consolidate power token then you uh, gain one power token from the supply and your opponent must return one of his power tokens to the supply and of course then the both order tokens are picked up and removed a raid, or, a raid order placed on a land uh, area cannot raid an adjacent sea area so this player couldn't resolve this raid token to remove this player's raid token because a land raid token cannot raid uh, a sea space. However, a sea raid order can raid an adjacent sea space or an adjacent land space so this player could um, use this raid order token to remove this raid order token. All right, let's talk about the march orders. You have two of those, one have a plus zero and one has a minus one. The march orders allow you to move units and start combat. The number printed on the raid order token is a combat strength modifier. So if you use that, or march order, if you use that march order to move into an enemy controlled area, 
you'll start a combat. If it was this one, that adds zero to your combat strength. So neither adds or subtracts. However, this one actually subtracts one from your combat strength. But let's talk about how you use it to move. So if you had a march order in this area you control, that allows you to move any or all of the units in this area. Now you can move them to any adjacent space. Um, you can move them both together to an adjacent space. Or you can move uh, one to this space and one to this space. If you ever leave a space you control with no units, you have the option to place one of your power tokens there from your from your supply you don't take it from the main supply it has to be one of the power tokens you have you can then place it in that area and then you still maintain the benefits of that space so that would allow you uh, To still get the supply from the barrel, you would still be able to muster there because you control that space. So whenever you leave any space you controlled um, and leave it with no units, you can um, use one of your power tokens if you move out of there and leave it there to maintain control and receive the benefit from that space. Now if an enemy moves into that space, then and you still have no units there then your power token is just removed and if you ever move unit back in there you don't get to pick up the power token it still just stays there so again a march order um, played into this area would allow you to use move both these units together to an adjacent space or into separate spaces now when you're moving you cannot uh, move units so that you ex um, exceed your, uh, you know, the armies that you're allowed by your supply. For example, if this was the case and this person played a march order and they were resolving it, they could not use, move both their units into that space because their supply only allows them to have an army with three units at the largest and that would make an army with four units so at most they could move one unit into that space but then they could either leave this one there or move it into another adjacent space if you use a march order to move units into an enemy occupied space then you'll start a combat there and we'll talk about how combat works in a little bit but if you move units into an in enemy occupied space then you will start a combat there now you can't like if you were had a march order here you couldn't move one unit here and start a combat and one unit here and start a combat you can only with one march order you can only move units such that you can start one combat so you could either you know move both units here or both units here or one unit here and leave the other one but you can't move with one march order so that you start two combats you can only move so that you start one combat a march order in a sea space allows you to move ships into an adjacent space and if there is an enemy ship in that space then you would start a combat. It also allows you to move a ship that's in a sea space to a port, or if you assigned a uh, order to a ship in a port, then um, that would allow you to move out into an adjacent sea space. Land units can never move into a sea space uh, with a march order, so if this march order was here, this unit cannot move into an adjacent sea space. However, ships can be used as bridges so if a player had a march order here they could use this ship as basically a bridge to move to one adjacent space they can move into any space since they're moving out of this space uh, basically onto this ship they could then move into any space that is adjacent um, to this sea area so they could move there or there uh, or here because that's adjacent so this 
ship acts like a bridge uh, in this sea space to any adjacent sea spaces or any adjacent land spaces to this sea space. And if you have ships in adjacent sea spaces, they act as a bridge to each other to each other. So this player, if he played a march order here and he had a unit he wanted to move here, he could basically use a bridge from this sea space to this sea space and then still move on to any land space adjacent to this sea space. So if he had ships going all the way down here, he could uh, move one unit from here you know all the way to a space down here as long as he had ships in each adjacent sea space all right i think that uh, pretty much covers march orders again the plus or minus here um, is a combat modifier if you do happen to move those units into combat and you when you're resolving combat um, this one would give you minus one to your combat strength and again we'll talk about combat later all right another type of power or token is the consolidate power token another type of order i guess so uh, when you place those orders and you're resolving consolidate power orders any place uh, that you have one allows you to um, when you resolve this order, it allows you to take one power token from the supply and put it into your personal supply. If you have a power token where there's also one printed on the board in an area you control, then you get a power token for the token and one for um, the icon, the graphic on the board. So in this case, when you resolve this consolidate power token, you would get uh, one for the token and one for the icon on the board. So you would get to take two power tokens and put it into your supply. Okay, another type of order uh, you can place is the support order. So we'll give an idea of how support order works. If this player was resolving a march order and he marched into this space to start a combat, any adjacent space as part of combat, you can call for support. So any adjacent spaces that have a support order in them, adjacent to where that combat is taking place, um, you can call for support if it's your own unit, that, or your own support order that you control that area, then your units in that space will offer their combat strength um, to you in that combat if it's an opponent's support order you can hope to uh, get them I mean obviously not the one you're combating but if if it's another opponent who's not involved in the combat you can try to convince them to lend you their support and if they agree then you would get the strength of their units in that area that had the support order if this player used a march order to move in here, he could call for support from his ship. Ships can lend support to adjacent sea spaces or adjacent land spaces. However, land units, if they had a support order, they cannot offer support uh, to adjacent sea spaces. And the final type of order is a defense order so for example if this player used a march order to march in here where this player has a defense order they would get plus one added to their combat strength and again we'll talk more about that and combat uh, here in a little bit those, so those are the five basic orders now remember we talked about, uh, depending on where you are on the King's Court track, you can place a number of special orders in, in place of the basic orders. So your uh, special orders have a little star on them. As you can see, the other ones don't. So the difference if you use um, the special raid order, you know, a normal raid order can be used to remove an opponent's raid or adjacent raid order or support order 
or consolidate power order. Uh, this one also lets you remove an adjacent. Uh, um, you can remove one of those or you can move remove an adjacent defense order as well. The special march order uh, token gives you plus one if you mark, move into an opponent's uh, controlled area to start a combat. It gives you plus one to your combat strength, whereas the others gave you a plus zero or a minus one, the basic march orders. The special consolidate power token works either just like a regular consolidate power token or if it's placed in an area you control with a stronghold or castle you can use it to muster uh, instead of doing the consolidate power you can use it to muster in that area and in that area only you don't get to muster all your castles and strongholds just the area that is placed in the special support order works just like the other support order you can support an adjacent combat um, with your unit strength plus one adding plus one to your uh, supporting units combat strength and the special defense order instead of adding plus one to your strength if you're being attacked uh, by an army uh, the special defense order um, let you add plus two to your strength if you're being attacked by an uh, opponent's army. So those are all the different orders. So back to the planning phase, which starts right after the Westeros phase. So that what happens in the planning phase is all players will assign one order token to each area they control that has a unit in it. Now if it's one where you've just placed a power token that you moved out of and left a power token to re retain control of that space you don't place an order token there you only place an order token where you have units and one order token per uh, area um, that you control with a unit again if you have you can place a number of special orders depending on where you are on the king's court track so in this case for example maybe um, if this is the start player, he's allowed to place two special orders. Uh, maybe he wants to move. Um, so he'll place a special... You, you place them face down now when you're placing them. So maybe he places a face down march order. Um, because he's allowed a special order, he's allowed two special orders. Uh, maybe he wants to muster here, so he, maybe he places a face down special consolidate power token there. And then perhaps maybe he wants to move this ship, so he'll place a face down uh, march order there. So all players will simultaneously place orders uh, in areas they control that have units, all of them face down. Once all players have placed their order tokens, players will then uh, all reveal their orders at the same time. So everybody will flip their order tokens face up. Once all the order tokens are revealed, the player who has the messenger raver, raven token is then has the option where they can swap one of their orders uh, with one they didn't place previously. So they can see what's been uh, what orders have been placed out on the board and then decide oh you know maybe i should have put a march order here instead of a consolidate power or a defense order here instead of a, a raid order or something so they can do that or again they can look at the top uh, wilding card and decide whether that should be put on the top or the bottom left on the top or moved to the bottom of the deck once all the orders are revealed and the player with the raven token decides if they're going to use it or not, then we all move to the next phase, which is the action phase, where you'll actually resolve the orders, and we'll talk about that now. Alright, so in the action phase, players will then resolve orders, um, starting with the raid order in turn order. So uh, in this case, if the Baratheon player had a raid order, he would resolve it. Now he would only resolve resolve one if if the Baratheon player had multiple raid orders. He would resolve one, 
Then you'd go on to the Lannister player. If he had one, he would resolve one. Then to the Stark player, if he had he, if he had one, he would resolve one. And then back if the Baratheon player had another raid order, then uh, it would be his turn to resolve that. And so you continue uh, going in turn order, each person resolving one raid order until all raid orders are resolved. So in this case, uh, the Brathian player um, say he doesn't have a raid order. The Lannister player has no raid order. Um, but the Stark player does have a raid order. So he'll resolve that to remove this support order uh, that the Lannister player had um, in an adjacent space. Okay, after all ra raid orders are resolved, then you resolve march orders again in turn order, starting with whoever is uh, first on the Iron Throne track, so this place the Baratheon player, if they have a march order, they would resolve that. Then if the Lannister player had a march order, they would resolve that. Then if the Stark player had a march order, they would resolve that. Then you'd go back again to the Baratheon player. If they had another march order, they would resolve that, and so on. And again, you go in the turn order on the Iron Throne track. So in this case, you know, so the Brathian player, he's first. He does have a raid order. I mean, a march order. <laughs> Sorry, we're resolving march orders now. Uh, he has a march order, so maybe he wants to move these two units here. Um, because he's moving out of this place and he wants to keep control of it, he may take one of his power tokens and put it in there so he retains control. And now because there's um, units of two opponents in here there would be a battle which we'd have to resolve so let's talk about resolving battles so the units moving in are the attacker the units that were already in place are the defender so first thing both sides will call for any support if they had uh, supporting uh, you know units in an adjacent area with a support order or another opponent not involved in the combat um, had supporting units in an adjacent area um, the players could try to call from support from them and get them to support them in this case there's no units with there's no uh, players with support around so there would be no support added both sides then calculate their initial combat strength so knights have a combat strength of two so the Baratheon player has two Footmen have a combat strength of one, so they have a total of three. The Lannister player has two footmen, so his combat strength is two, but he had a defense order of plus one, so he has a total of three. So currently they both have a total of three combat strength. Both players then choose one of their house cards to play in the combat. Um, they both choose simultaneously put them out in front of them. When both players have their card chosen, they reveal them at the same time. So the cards, um, each player's cards are a little bit different, but they'll give you an additional combat strength, and then they may have some text. For instance, we'll just look at this one as an example. So this would add, if this player chose to play this card, it would add two to his combat strength, and if your Stannis Baratheon house card, which is, you know, this one here, is in your discard pile, this card gains plus one combat strength and a, a sword icon. So it's not in his discard pile, so he wouldn't get that benefit right now. A card goes into your discard pile. Whenever you play a card in combat, it stays in your discard pile, it doesn't go back to your hand. So every combat you'll have fewer cards. The only way you uh, get your cards back is when you play your last combat card out of your hand, then you pick up all the cards that you've already played and put them back into your hand except for the last one that you just played and it stays in your discard pile. Some of the other icons that are on the, these cards is, you know, like this one, Melisandra. It adds one to the player's combat strength, and it has one sword icon which will deal one casualty. So if you win the combat, then the uh, player 
the player who played this card, if they win the combat, then they deal one casualty uh, to their opponent, so their opponent would have to remove one of their units. If a card has a tower on it, like this has both a sword and a tower, so it would deal, if this player won, uh, they would deal one casualty. However, if they, however, if they lost, because it has a fortification icon, if the, their opponent played something with a sword icon or multiple sword icons, this would block one of the sword icons um, of the opponent that defeated them. So we'll just say, for example, the Baratheon player in our combat decides he's going to play this. He would put it face down in front of him or just hold it um, until the other player is ready. The Lannister player then chooses his card. They both reveal at the same time. So the Lannister player played Sir Gregor Clegane, uh, which gives him um, three combat strength in addition to the three he already has. So that gives him a total of six combat strength. Additionally, He'll be uh, dealing three casualties with it because he played a card with three swords. The uh, Baratheon player played the Brienne of Tarth, which gives two, giving him only a total of five combat strength. So he will end up losing this battle. Now, if one of them, if one of these players had the uh, Valerian Blade, they could play that to add one to their combat strength and then turn it over. But in this case, the how start player has the Valerian blade. So the, the total combat strength for Lannister would be six and for Baratheon would be five so the Baratheon player would lose and because this player played this card dealing three casualties um, but the Baratheon player played this one which has one fortification they block one so they have to take two casualties so they would actually have to remove both of their Uh, units from the board and then because this player was successful in winning this combat the uh, opponent's defense token would just be removed and put back in their supply we'll give another example and say the Lannister played this card instead the hound and now they're tied they both have because they both played a card with a combat strength of two they both have a total of um, five, so that's still a tie. So then we go to whoever is higher on the fiefdom track, which currently Baratheon is higher than Lannister, so the Baratheon player would end up winning this combat. So they would deal one casualty, but the card the Lannister player blocks two casualties, so they'd make take two casualties but I mean they would not have to take any casualties because the one they would have been dealt is blocked by the two fortification icons but they still lost the battle since since the uh, Lannister player lost the battle they would then have to retreat so they can retreat to any friendly area or empty adjacent area so they could uh, retreat here or here anyway to any empty adjacent area or friendly area and of course they'd have to pick up uh, that's actually a Stark token instead of a Lannister but I was just using an example um, but because they retreated they would have to pick up their defense token the retreating units um, could not retreat to the area from whence, whence the attacker came and they have to retreat to the same location. One couldn't retreat here and one retreat there. They could also not retreat um, here if, if there were already units here and retreating there would cause them to exceed their uh, supply limit. You know, this player uh, can only have an army of a maximum of three units, so they could not retreat here 
and make an army of four units, they would have to eliminate one and then retreat the other one if that's where they wanted to go. But of course this space is empty so they could retreat there. If there's no legal area for them to retreat, then they're both just eliminate, or you know, the retreating units are just eliminated. Once units retreat, then they're placed on their side and they're considered routed and um, they cannot add their combat strength uh, to any combat while they're routed and if routed units are forced to retreat they're just destroyed instead. At the end of the round any routed units can be stood back up again. If the attacking player loses the combat and they have to retreat then they have to retreat from the area that they came from. And as I said, the cards played in that combat stay in the player's discard player and uh, they can only retrieve them once they've played the last card from their hand or if they have some card uh, that allows them to retrieve their cards. For example, the start player has this Roos Bolton card where if you lose this combat you can return your, Howard, your entire house discard pile into your hand, including this card. But normally you only get them back once you've played the last card from your hand. Because this player played this token, of course he add, didn't add anything to his combat strength. If his march order had been this one, he would have actually had to subtract one from his combat strength. But if he had played this march order token, he would add one to his combat strength in that combat. Alright, so continuing with the action phase, once each player has resolved all their march order tokens, you then move on to the uh, consolidate power tokens. Again, going in turn order, the Brathian player would resolve one of his consolidate power tokens. Then the next person on the uh, turn order, so the Lannister player would resolve one of his. For example, he played this one, so he would pick this token up and he would get one power token for the um, order that he played and one for the space because it's printed on the board so he would get two power tokens into his supply and then he just put, picks this up and puts it back in his uh, order token area and so players would go around in turn order resolving all their consolidate uh, power tokens and then finally you have cleanup where you'd pick up any uh, support and defense tokens that were on the board. You'd stand up any routed units. If the Valerian blade or the messenger token had been flipped because they were used, uh, they would be flipped back over. And that ends the round. You would then start another round with the Westeros phase where you would then advance the turn marker. And Again, flip over three new Westeros cards. Uh, so, a couple things we haven't talked about. As I mentioned, when you flip over the Westeros cards, um, for any of the wilding icons that appear, you advance the wilding token. If the wilding token ever reaches 12, you then resolve a wilding attack. There is one other way you might <clears throat> resolve a wilding attack, even if the token hadn't reached all the way. Uh, you might draw a Westeros card that says the Wildings attack. And in that case, the token may not be all the way at 12 yet. Um, but in either case, when the token reaches 12 or when a card is drawn saying the Wildings attack, um, no matter where the threat token is, you then resolve a Wilding attack. So the first thing you'll do um, when there's a Wilding attack is determine the Wildings, uh, Wildlings uh, strength. So if the wildling attack happened because the token was at 12, then their strength is at 12. If it happened uh, because of a card when it's lower, then their strength is whatever uh, space they are on the wildling track. Each player will then take his power tokens um, and put them behind his screen and choose a number they want to uh, help bid to help... Uh, overcome the wildling attack so they'll choose a number put them in their hand once everybody's ready they reveal 
if the total power bid by all players equals or exceeds the wildling, wildling strength, then they defeat the wildlings. If it's less than, um, then the wildlings uh, are successful. And in either case, you then resolve the top card of the wildling deck, and you look if the wildlings were victorious, you read and resolve that portion of the cards. So in this case, whoever was the lowest bidder um, to defeat the wildlings would move his tokens uh, to the lowest position on every influence track. And everyone else, in turn order, each player chooses either the fiefdoms or the king's court influence track and moves his token to the lowest position so it's always something bad if the wildlings uh, are victorious you would read this portion if the players bid equal or exceeds the wildlings uh, power and so then the night watch it was victorious and you would resolve whatever is there which in this case the highest bid or so whoever bid the most power tokens moves his token to the top of one influence track of his choice, then takes the appropriate dominance token. And again, they're different for each uh, wildling card. Then this card would be, after it's resolved, it's discarded to the bottom of the pile, like so. If the players were victorious, therefore the Knight's Watch was victorious, then the wildling threat token gets moved all the way back to zero. However, if the wildlings uh, were victorious, then the token only moves down two spots from where it was on, on the track. And of course, all power tokens that were bid are then just returned to the general supply, and then players would put their, their remaining power tokens back uh, in front of their player screens, visible to the other players. Um, another thing we should just talk a little bit more again about his ports. Now ports can only hold ship units and they can only hold a maximum of three ship units and of course any ship units in there if there's more than one it's considered an army and so it has to comply with your uh, supply limits as far as armies go. You can muster uh, ships into a port even if there's enemy ships in the connected sea. Um, but you couldn't, like if you were doing a muster, you couldn't muster a ship uh, into this location if there's in, an enemy ship there, but you could muster it into the port. And as I think I mentioned before, uh, ships in a port must receive an order token. Any area that has your units must receive an order token when you're doing the uh, planning phase. And I think as I mentioned, I think I mentioned before, if a uh, ship has a march order they could march into a friendly port or if they were in the port and assigned a march order they can march out into a sea space um, but you can never uh, assign a ship to for example uh, move into an enemy port so if this was owned by uh, the Baratheon player you couldn't assign a march order to the Lannister ship and have them march into that port because it's an enemy port. If a ship is in a port and has a support icon, it could support ships in an adjacent sea space, but could not support combat in an adjacent land space. And they provide no combat strength to uh, units that are in an adjacent land space. And just remember that's a little different because a ship in an adjacent sea space with a support icon can support an adjacent land space. Same with a raid order. Ships in a port can raid adjacent sea spaces, but they cannot raid adjacent land spaces, which is different than a ship in a, a uh, sea space, which can raid an adjacent land space. If a ship in a port has a consolidate power oak <laughs> token when you're resolving that, um, just as if you had a consolidate power token in a land area, you would get one power token. But if there was an enemy ship in an adjacent sea location, 
then when you go to resolve that consolidate power token in a port, you don't get a power token. So there's just, a, as you can see, there's just a few little uh, different rules for ports that uh, are different um, for ships that are in sea locations. If enemy units uh, take control of a connected land area to uh, where you have a ship in a port, then the uh, enemy player may immediately replace any ships in that port with ships uh, of his own, as long as he doesn't end up creating an army that exceeds his supply. If you'll remember, we put a couple of neutral force tokens on there that uh, did actually have a strength number. Um, this one and this one, King's Landing and the Airy. A player can take uh, over those areas if they move an army into that area who, whose total strength is greater than the number shown on that uh, neutral force token. So example, here a player would have to move an army into this space uh, whose strength is um, six or greater and then um, if they do that they can remove that token and then they can control that area otherwise they can't march in there now that strength total can be the total of units you move in there plus uh, if your march order order token um, whatever the march order token bonus is. You don't get to play a house card, but if you have adjacent uh, supporting units um, that are gonna, that can support you or will support you, um, then you can count their strength as well. And if you're the player with the, the Valerian Steel Blade, you cannot use it to add plus one to your combat strength. But anyway, that's how you would take over um, one of those neutral areas. As far as the garrisons, they add uh, two points of uh, combat strength to the player that owns that home area. So all players start with a garrison in their home area at the beginning, so that will always, when that area is attacked, um, add two to the total strength of that um, area. If the home area of a player is ever defeated, then the garrison token is just permanently removed. And we've almost covered everything. I did want to talk about a couple of features on the map. Rivers that separate areas um, does not make... <laughs> if a river se separates an area, like in this case, they are not considered adjacent. So this area is not considered adjacent to this area. Um, for any game purposes. Um, if there's a bridge over them like this, then these are considered adjacent in here. These are considered adjacent, this space and this space. But if there's not, a, um, and so for example here, this river divides these two spaces so they are not considered adjacent. Though the, these two are because there is a line um, there. Also, like the Dragonstone, the home area here for Baratheon, is an island off on its own. So it is not considered adjacent to any of these land areas in order to uh, move units um, from Dragonstone to one of these land areas. Uh, you would have to have a ship um, to use as, you know, the ship transport rule we talked about earlier. And there's some more locations like that on the board down here. We have the Arbor. It's an island location. And up here, Pike, which in a three-player game is uh, not used. Whenever you take control of an area um, that has a stronghold or a castle, you adjust your victory marker um, up on the victory track showing that you've gained another strong, stronghold or castle. If you took it from another player, then of course they would move their marker down on the victory track. If a player ever, ever gains his seventh stronghold or castle area, control of a seventh stronghold or castle area, then they immediately win the game. 
If that doesn't happen before the end of the 10th round, then at the end of the 10th round, whoever is higher on the victory track wins the game. If two people are tied um, at that point for the most uh, victory, then whichever of them controls the most strongholds wins the game. If that is still a tie, then whichever of the tied players is higher on the supply track would win the game. If there was still a tie then, whichever player had the most power tokens would win. If there was still a tie then, which is very unlikely, but if there was, then whoever was higher on the Iron Throne track would win the game. So I think we've covered most all the rules. I'm sure there's some uh, little thing here or there that I didn't cover, but I think we covered most of them. I'm going to go ahead and reset everything back to how it should be at the start of the game, and we'll go through an example round or two. Before we get started with the example turns, I had neglected when we were talking about combat to talk about the siege engine unit. I did mention that the uh, knight provides two combat strength, the footman provides one. The siege engine provides four combat strength if you are attacking an area with a stronghold or castle. If you're attacking uh, an area that does not have a stronghold or castle, then the siege engine provides zero strength. And if you are defending, a siege engine provides zero strength. If you are um, supporting a combat that's taking place if, um, with, uh, in an area that has a stronghold or castle, um, then it also provides uh, for combat strength um, for, for you know coming from the supporting army but again if you're supporting a combat in an area with no castle or stronghold then it provides zero combat strength also if a uh, siege engine would ever have to retreat it just is removed it, it can't retreat it's just destroyed okay and i just wanted to mention that i'd forgotten to mention that in combat so let's get on with the example turns Alright, I believe we've got everything set back up um, to everybody where they were and should be at the beginning of the game right after setup. So uh, this is the first round of the game, so we don't have a Westeros phase in the first round of the game. So we go straight to the planning phase, and that's where everybody can uh, will place an order in each area where they have uh, a unit. And of course the Lannister player can place three special orders if he wants to, the start player can place two special orders if they want to, and the Brathian player can only place one special order because that's where they are on the King's Court track. So we'll say Lannister is going to place this uh, special uh, order here in his home area. We'll say he'll put this order here in the Stony Sept. And this order he'll place here with his ship in the Golden Sound. All right, so we've got an order for each uh, area for Lannister that uh, has a unit. I'm going to go ahead and place out orders for the other people off camera. Then when we do the action phase um, or, or the reveal phase in the at the reveal section of the planning phase, I'll reveal them all, and then we'll do the action phase. Alright, so now I have order tokens placed with the Baratheon units and the Stark units as well. So that's the assign orders part of the planning phase. Now we go to the reveal orders. So now everybody would just flip their orders over. Alright, now the Lannister player because they have the Messenger Raven, they could, if they wanted to, they could uh, swap out one of the orders they placed for a different order, or they could look at the top card of the Wildling deck and decide whether to put that on the top or the bottom. Um, they're not going to do either. They just choose not to do either. 
All right, so now we go to the action phase. Um, so first thing we would do in the action phase is resolve any raid orders in turn order. No player put out any raid orders, so there's no raid orders to resolve. So now we move on to march orders. All right, the Baratheon player did put out march orders. They put out two, so they choose one to resolve. Um, I think they're going to resolve this one. So they have uh, ships here which allow them to move across from their island. So he's going to move a knight um, over here to Cracklaw Point, you know, using his ship as a transport. And I guess he'll go ahead and move both units over there. All right, so that's going to give him another area with a castle that he controls. So he gets to move his uh, victory marker up to the two now he'll pick up his raid order or his march order and just put that back in his area all right now the Lannister player gets to resolve a march order and he did place two of them now we'll just say he's going to resolve this one you know he would get a minus one if he moves into combat he's going to move up here into Iron Man's Bay and uh, nothing else is going to happen. There's no combat or anything. So now he just places the, places this march order back into his area. Okay, Stark is next. So he uh, did play two march orders. So he'll go ahead and resolve this march order. He did a special march order um, plus one. But he's not moving into combat. So that's really not going to make a difference. <clears throat> he's going to move, uh, he'll move his knight here and a footman here because he moved the knight. Now he controls this area with a castle that's going to move him up one on the victory track. So he'll move there and then he's going to pick up his special march order and just put that back in his area. Now he did leave this area empty, but because that's his home area, you know the shield printed on his home area just counts as a power token as if he left a power token there so again in your home area you don't have to leave a power token if you want to retain control of it when you move your units out of there all right we come back to the baratheon player they have another march order um, that they have with these ships so he'll execute that and he's going to move a ship up here into the narrow sea um, there's no combat that takes place so the plus one doesn't matter and uh, that's I'll just then put this back in his he was allowed one special order which is the one he played so that'll just go back in his area all right the Lannister gets to resolve any March orders he has which he still does have one he's going to move uh, He's going to move here to River Run. He will leave a power token to retain control of the Stony Sept. And that will give him a new area um, with a stronghold. So he will get to move up on the victory track. And then uh, no combat takes place. So he'll just pick up his token and put that back in his area. All right, now we come to the Stark player. He still has a march order to play, and he's going to move. He's going to play it and move into this area, which is going to initiate a combat because there's an enemy ship there. He gets a plus zero to his strength. They each have one to their strength. Currently, nobody has any uh, support or anything, so uh, their initial combat strength is one each. Now they'll each play a house card. All right, so they each pick a card and reveal it. The Baratheon player plays the Melisandre, which adds one to their combat strength and has a sword icon. The Stark player played um, Creation, Gratian, Umbar. I'm not sure who that. Anyway, that adds two to his combat strength, so that's going to give him a total of three combat strength against a total of two combat strength. Um, from the Baratheon player, so the Stark player wins um, because he was the winner of the combat. 
He also could have flipped his sword if it would have been a tie to give him another point, but he doesn't need to. And he does uh, deal one casualty. Um, they do not have a fortification, so they can't get out of the casualty. So this ship is destroyed for the Baratheon player. Now these cards stay in the discard pile. And now his uh, March Order token just goes back into his area. All right, now we would come back to the Baratheon player. He has no more March Orders. The Lannister player has no more March Orders. And the Stark player has no more March Orders. So now we go on to the Consolidate Power Orders, starting with the Baratheon player. He does have one, so that gives him one power, plus the one that's on the uh, board printed there. So he gets two power tokens. And this will just go back into his area. The uh, Lannister player played a Consolidate Power token, but he's going to he played a special Consolidate Power token, so he's going to use that to muster here in Lannisport, and he's going to muster a a siege engine since he's at, uh, can muster at a stronghold that gives him two points. To muster so a siege engine and a knight cost two points so he's going to get a siege engine uh, he's still within his army limits because he can have an army of three an army of two and an army of two so he's got an army of three and he doesn't even have another army of two or two so he's well within his supply limits all right now how stark also has a consolidate power token and they played a special one as well so instead of getting uh, power tokens they too are going to muster now they're muster mustering at a castle instead of a stronghold so they only get one point of muster and they are going to muster a ship and because this area they're mustering from they could muster it into this port but uh, they're going to muster it here this is adjacent to this uh, Shivering Sea, so that's where they are going to muster that ship at. And then this token just goes back into their area. Alright, then when we go back to Lannister, uh, there is no, they have no more Consolidate Power tokens. I mean, uh, Baratheon, uh, neither does Lannister, and neither does stark um, so now we would just pick up any support or defense tokens uh, orders but there's none out so that's going to end the action phase so now we'll go to the westeros phase where we will advance the time marker on the or the round marker on the round track we'll now reveal one card in each of the three decks we didn't get any wildling tokens, so we don't need to advance the threat marker. The first one is mustering. Recruit new units in strongholds and castles. All right, Baratheon player's gonna muster at their stronghold here. They, because it's a stronghold, they get two points of mustering. They're gonna muster a knight there. They do not get to muster in this area that they control because there's no castle or stronghold. This area is a castle, so they do get one point of mustering there. They're going to spend their one point of muster here to upgrade this footman to a knight. So they'll replace it with a knight. And now that's all the mustering they could do. Alright, the Lannister can do two points of mustering here, but they already have an army of three. Um, so they can't add another unit there because their supply doesn't let them have an army larger than three. However, they could spend a point, uh, one point of mustering here to upgrade this footman to a knight. So they'll do that. And then they can spend their other point of mustering to muster a ship either in this port or in the Golden Sound. And I think they'll muster it here in the Golden Sound. So that's the two points for that stronghold. They have another stronghold here that they can that gives them two points of mustering. So they're going to muster a knight there in River Run. 
and this area they control it but it doesn't have a castle or stronghold so they can't muster there they are within their supply limits because they have an army of three and an army of two and the single units don't have an, don't count as an army and they're allowed to have three and two and two all right finally stark even though they have no units here this is their home area so they kill still control uh, Winterfell and that has a stronghold so they get two points of mustering there so they are going to muster a footman and then a ship in the Bay of Ice and this uh, area is adjacent to the Bay of Ice so that's where they're gonna muster a ship so that's two points of mustering they also get one point of mustering here and one point of mustering here so for White Harbor here they're going to muster a ship here into the narrow sea and for Moat Kalen here they're gonna must they get one point of mustering there they're going to muster a footman all right that resolves all the mustering so we go to the next car each player collects one power token for each out power icon printed on areas he controls so the Brathian player will get one two power tokens so we'll put those in his supply of power tokens the Lannister player controls this area because he has a power token there so that's one controls this area two his home area Lannisport doesn't have any so he just gets two as well so he'll take two power tokens and put them in his area and finally up here Stark has one printed in his home area and that looks like that is it so he just gets one unfortunately and finally the last card uh, the holder of the valerian steel blade which is house stark chooses one of the following for the planning phase either defense orders cannot be played or march orders plus one cannot be played or no restrictions uh, he's going to say defense orders cannot be played all right, so now we go to the planning phase. I'll do that off camera where all the players will choose their orders and place them in the areas that they have units. All right, I've got all orders uh, have been placed out by all the players. So now we reveal the orders. Now the holder of the Messenger Raven token, which is the Lannister player, can decide to swap out one of his orders if he wants to. Um, he doesn't want to swap one of his orders. We'll just say he wants to look at the top card of the Wilding deck. Let's see. So if the Wildlings are victorious, uh, they choose one. Lowest bidder destroys two of his units. Um, Let's see if they're victorious, the highest bidder, wildlings immediately attack again. So this is no good. So we're going to put that to the bottom of the pile. All right, so he used his messenger raven, so now he'll flip that over. All right, now we move to the action phase, starting with the Baratheon player. He'll resolve a raid order. He'll resolve this one, which allows him to remove a raid order um, or... Um, there can't be any defense orders because uh, that wasn't allowed by this card. But it, it, he didn't play a special one anyway, so that couldn't remove a defense order. But normally it can re remove a raid order, consolidate power order, or a support order. But he will. He is adjacent to this raid order, which was placed by Stark. So he'll play his raid order to remove Stark's raid order. Okay, now the Lannister player can resolve a raid order, which he has one, but uh, there's nothing adjacent for him to remove, it doesn't look like, so uh, that raid order is just going to go to waste, so he'll just put that in his area. Okay, now the uh, Stark player, he does have a raid order placed also. Again, there's nothing adjacent to it, so nothing really happens with that raid order. Back to the Baratheon player, he doesn't have another raid order. Raid order, the Stark player does, 
but there's nothing adjacent to it so again that one's just discarded with no effect and the start player does not have uh, any other raid orders out okay so now we move on to march orders the Baratheon player does have a march order he played here he's going to use it to move this guy to the reach he's going to place a power token there to retain control of the Kingswood and that gives him another castle so he'll move up on the victory track all right now we move to the uh, Lannister player he played a um, couple of March orders so he's got to choose one he's going to choose this one and he's going to move a uh, knight using ship transport so he can use this ship to go to this ship which can take him here to Flint's finger and um, that will give him another castle so he'll get to move up on the victory track as well so he's executed this order it was with a minus one but there's no combat so that doesn't matter all right we come to the start player he's he has a march order uh, plus one he's going to use that and use ship transport to uh, move him move this guy to uh, the twins he will leave a, a uh, power token behind <clears throat> to maintain control of that. That was a plus one, but again, it doesn't matter because he didn't get in any kind of combat. Back to the Baratheon player. He has another uh, march order that he's going to use. He will... Uh, it's got a plus one, but he's going to move here. He's not going to get into combat. He will leave a power token behind to retain control of uh, Crack Claw Point. That's going to give him another castle, so he will move up on the victory track. And now that order is executed, so that just goes back into his area. Now to the Lannister player, and that just so happens to be where he wanted to go maybe now he could up there go up there and get a stronghold but I want to show one more combat before we end this so we'll say he wanted to take the Heron Hall here so he's going to move his units uh, in there um, with this march order and so now we'll have a combat so the Baratheon has two knights so they've got an initial strength of four whereas uh, Lannister has a knight and a footman which would give them three but they also got a plus one for their march order so right now they're tied with an initial strength of four so now they each got to play a house card all right so they both select their cards and reveal them he plays Renly Baratheon with a strength of three if you win this combat you may upgrade one of your participating footmen well he doesn't even have a participating footman in the combat um, oh, this is Lannister, not Stark. He played uh, Sir Jamie Lannister, which is worth two, um, and has a, a sword. So they both had an initial combat strength of four, but then Baratheon played a strength three, which gives him seven. Lannister only played a two, which only gives him six. So Baratheon player wins. So the Lannister player has to retreat uh, back to where he came, and then his token, um, because the Baratheon player didn't have a sword or anything, the Lannister player doesn't have to take any casualties. Um, but he did, if he wins this combat, he gets to upgrade one of his footmen, but he doesn't have any footmen in the combat. So anyway, uh, now this uh, token just goes back into Lannister's area. So now at this point, uh, the Baratheon player's got two of his house cards in his discard pile. Lannister and Stark just have one of their house cards in their discard pile. All right, Stark, uh, he has a march order. He's going to use that just to move up here and uh, take control of the Castle Black there. And so that's going to be used. Again, he doesn't have to place a power token because that's his home area and I don't think anybody else has any march orders left oh yes uh, Stark does still have one march order left so 
it goes back to Baratheon, but he doesn't have any. Then to Lannister, but he doesn't have any. Uh, Stark does have one with his ship. He's going to move his ship here into the Sunset Sea. There is no uh, enemies in there, so that won't cause a combat. All right, so that's all the March orders. Now we go to Consolidate Power orders, starting with Baratheon. He's got one here, so he'll get a power token for this one and for the one printed there, so he'll get two power tokens. Um, Lannister did not play any Consolidate Power. Stark did. He played one. Doesn't have one printed, so he just gets one uh, power token back to... Baratheon, but he doesn't have any more. All right, so that's going to end. Now we would do cleanup. There's a support order that uh, um, the start played that didn't come into play, so that just gets picked up and put back with his tokens. And that's it for cleanup. We would then begin a new Westeros phase where we advance the round marker and deal out three new Westeros cards. But this video is very long already. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up. I think you should have a good idea how this game plays. Um, I did play this game one time uh, with four players, uh, three, friend, three friends of mine, a um, long time ago, back around 2013. And uh, at that time, uh, the, the guys I played with, I guess they just didn't think it... it really had a good Game of Thrones theme. I mean, it's got the names of the the areas and stuff, but uh, they were a little disappointed with these units that they weren't figures, and I kind of agree with that. I, it seems like they could have made some little knights and some little, you know, footman figures and some better-looking ships instead of these chunky plastic uh, miniatures they're not even miniatures i don't know what you call them but yeah that's a little disappointing and yes your house cards have names of characters that were in the books or tv show but that doesn't really come through uh you know i wish it was more kind of like war of the ring where you actually had some of these main characters as figures on the board that you moved around and and uh Maybe some more theme would come through that way. So um, I think this game is okay, um, but I don't really get a lot of Game of Thrones theme coming from it. Uh, I don't feel like I'm in the Game of Thrones world other than just the names of areas. Um, but, uh, I mean, the gameplay seems all right. I do want to give it another try uh, with... with Player, I've I've heard it's you know best with six players, or if you're gonna play with fewer, like four players, like I I the one time I did play it um, with other players, that you need the the expansion. I think it's the Mother of Dragons expansion or something that makes playing with fewer than six players better. So maybe I need to get that and try that. Um, anyway, I'm gonna wrap it up. It's been really long. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.